journalism, identification means, hides his name, what else do you need to know to know who this person is, his job, his age, his, you know, something about him. So that's kind of the separation between somebody's name and explanation of who they are. Uh, we sometimes, at least in the textbooks that I've studied and written, what I write myself is the other, second part is identification. So you have their name, that is a type of identification, but that doesn't tell you, like, for example, just for legal reasons, um, you need to give more than somebody's name. Because there's a lot more, there are a lot of Ken Harveys in America. And so if a newspaper reports that Ken Harvey was arrested for rape, they better give enough identification that I don't sue them, right? Because that wasn't me, Ken Harvey. Um, and so identification is really important uh, in journalism to identify, to separate somebody's uh, ID, if you want to abbreviate it in those terms, uh, from somebody else with the same name. Uh, because that's, like say, that's something you end up with court in and be sued for a million dollars or more if, if it could be mixed up with somebody with the same name. And so that's what we refer to as identification, is give us more information that somebody from outside can tell that this, uh, that this isn't that Ken Harvey that was arrested for something. Um, the, sometimes that is uh, an age uh, is part of that identification. Uh, so especially in, in criminal sort of stories, you might say Ken Harvey 29, uh, from uh, Seattle, Washington, da 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 da. You give them that sort of identification. Now they know it's not me because they have a pretty good idea I'm not 29. Um, and so that helps separate the Ken Harveys of the world by giving that sort of information. Where's he from? What's his age? What's he do? Uh, you know, what's his career or whatever? So that all, uh, in, in, uh, especially in print journalism at least, is referred to as identification. So that's what I meant when I said identification, and I gave you an example of what I was looking for in the instructions. Uh, not not an over amount of identification. We don't didn't need a lot, but some identification. Who is this person? Where are they from? What year are they? Where are they studying? Was basically what I was asking for. Or identification, by the way, I was interpreting that word. And uh, so it's not a big deal. I'm just trying to explain what I was looking for and, and those, the, how that term is used sometimes. So be careful on that. In fact, I, I happened to do, when I was working at the Daily Newspaper, I became kind of concerned about this issue. And in my studies, I, I concluded that a lot of newspapers, including the one I was working for, could be sued successfully for not providing adequate identification uh, because uh, there was, uh, particularly in America, I don't know if they do here or where they do when they don't, but uh, that the reporters would sometimes go to the, uh, to the police station and they would look at the entire list of everybody who was arrested. And they would write down uh, all the names and what they're arrested for. And in many cases, they were not given enough information to give a real full ID. And so it was not uncommon for them to um, give an I, you know, say that so-and-so was arrested and there would be more than one person by that name in the same city. Uh, they were arrested for something serious, you know, like rape. And so my conclusion to my, in my own understanding of, of communication law was a newspaper running that that uh, information, even though it was coming straight from the police, they were not giving enough identification to keep themselves from being sued. And so uh, I, I suggested to my boss that it was worth uh, a, doing a survey. In order to do the survey, I had to promise I would never publish the survey. Uh, so it's never been published. It was a good, it was a good study that could never be published, uh, except for the participants. And it was basically a survey of whether the editors of the daily newspapers throughout uh, Washington State, what, whether they thought they might be sued for not having adequate identification in these uh, crime criminal records that they were that they were publishing. Uh, and it turned out, I have a copy of it. I, it's been a while since I read it, but I think 
anyway, there was a lot of concern. There was concern over it. They knew that they were, nobody in the state had ever been sued for that. And maybe partly because they were getting it directly from the police. And so it was kind of the police fault that they weren't giving more information. But um, nonetheless, uh, if it wasn't a majority, it was a large share of them. I think it was a majority of them felt like they were in jeopardy running those sorts of police records without adequate identification. So that's kind of the background why I do think about it quite a bit as I did the study and, and it, it was actually a, a concern for the editors of all the daily papers in Washington, which I, I can't remember how many there were that I surveyed, but there are quite a few. Um, and like I say, it was a good study. It was important information that I could not share with anybody uh, because they didn't want to, they didn't want to, basically they didn't want to tell their readers, gee, you could sue us probably by what we're doing. So that was the last thing. They did not want that to go public, that, that half of the editors in the state thought that they could be sued for not providing adequate information or identification to separate, you know, to separate one Ken Harvey from another Ken Harvey, another whatever, Joe Smith or whatever name you want to come up with. So uh, identification is an important factor in journalism. And uh, that's what I was referring to uh, in in uh, the instructions. So it didn't matter. I, I'm not going to because it was a confusion over terms that I didn't explain. Uh, you're not nobody's going to get penalized for that. But just so you know what I was talking about. Uh, but do read all the instructions as close as you know. Make sure that you. I haven't graded uh, project one yet because I've given you a chance to do some rewriting on that. So I'll try to grade those in the next few days and get those back to you. Um, I don't know if there are any other problems that uh, there was confusion over how it would be presented and and so forth. There were some problems in your formatting. I can tell you this. Uh, again, I, I'm going to try to ignore it. Some of you tried to do two columns in your Word documents, but it became the, the second column uh, was not always real clear which story it went with. Uh, when it broke into two columns. And so uh, I would have, I think you would have been better off having just one column, not having trying to do two columns. Not that you're going to do it again, but that's uh, just formatting wise. Um, I've seen some that were kind of confusing as to what, where this dab of, of text over in the right column, what it went to. Because sometimes they were, they were separated in, in strange ways by trying to go with two columns. Uh, so would not have wanted you to do that. Uh, and you do, I guess you do have some responsibility for just looking at it and saying, does this make sense? I don't know why, I don't know why people thought they should go with two columns. I don't know if my example gave two columns. I don't remember it did, but anyway, uh, there were quite a few people that decided to go with two columns and, and the, the word didn't break them, break the uh, text very well in doing that. Okay, so... Um, I think that's kind of just reviewing and, on, and talking about project three. Let me talk about some other subjects then. Um, different challenges depending on the types of interview that you're doing. Uh, so, for example, interviewing politicians. How to handle politicians. And I would say this, this could expand to other people as well. Um, it's really, it's usually not hard to get a politician to talk because they like to talk. And they like to see themselves on camera. They like to see themselves in the newspaper. Uh, that helps them to be reelected. And so politicians are usually not hard to get to talk other than, you know, the higher up you go, the more their time is, is uh, restrained. And so if there's, if you're, you know, a, a congressman in an American Congress, uh, you can't have a lot of individual interviews. You just don't have time for it. And so getting an individual interview might be more difficult. Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be because they wouldn't want to be interviewed. It'd be only because of the time constraints. So they have a lot of press conferences. Uh, press conferences, um, if you watched any in America, you, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the journalists in America they're supposed to take one question. They usually try to fit two or three into one question uh, in order to, to I don't know, just grab more attention uh, if it shows up on TV or something. Um, 
it sometimes confuses the interviewee when you throw too much at them. But that's kind of an abnormality because of it being a press conference. And if you have 50 people trying to ask, wanting to ask a question for one person to get, get, get much video time for himself, uh, they're kind of feel like they're forced to do that. Uh, so that's not your typical interview, however. Uh, they are, you know, press conferences are interesting from both the interviewee's perspective and the interviewer's perspective. From the interviewee's perspective, uh, they have to, especially if they're a politician, they learn how not to answer questions, but sound like they're answering questions. In other words, you ask them a question and they answer a different question that they wanted to answer. So they've prepared some answers to some questions and they're bound and determined to give the answers to those questions, even whether or not you ask the questions. And so they, politicians are good at controlling you as the interviewer. Um, so you have to watch for that. You have to watch out for, for interviewees that are really savvy, uh, really smart about getting what they want. You see that in debates, uh, even when they have a whole bunch of uh, candidates for president of the United States, uh, you'll find, you'll see them doing the same thing. They'll prepare certain things that they want, certain talking points they want to, that's what they call them in America, talking points. Certain talking points they want to make during a debate or during the interview. And if they have to ignore the question, they'll do it. Um, and so then you as the interviewer, sometimes uh, they are bold enough to interrupt an answer if they feel like the, the person is avoiding the question. <clears throat> And so in order not to let them just wander off totally off base too long, they, inter they interrupt and try to reiterate the question, try to pin them down to answer the question that was actually asked and not answer the question they wanted to ask. Uh, so that sometimes you're, you're having to do that with uh, politicians, especially not just politicians, but politicians are probably the best trained at how to avoid the questions they don't want to answer and how to get the information they want, uh, the talking points, uh, out to the public, whether or not you ask the question that they want you to ask. So watch out for politicians. They are crafty, and they will try to control you as you do the interview. So you need to think about what you're going to do. Again, you may have to interrupt them. Uh, you, if you interrupt them too much, you're going to be seen as inserting yourself too much. There's a lot of uh, interviews like that on YouTube when it comes to liberal uh, journalists interviewing uh, conservative politicians. They feel like uh, that the liberals are are not being are not being fair and they're not being they're being biased. So they sometimes come in though and they have their talking points, and truthfully, they they should be interrupted. <laughs> Uh, except that the questions are one-sided. So it's kind of, I don't know how to think about it on one hand. On one hand, yes, the journalist is very biased. We've seen that by previous coverage. So I know why the, the, the politician is trying to control the content a little bit. On the other hand, if I were, even if I were sharing the same uh, political orientation as a person I'm, I'm interviewing, I'm going... I'm not going to appreciate him wandering off and avoiding my question. And so I sometimes anyway would interrupt his answer in order to get in order to get him back on target, back on the subject I want to talk about. So be prepared to do that especially with a politician. You're probably not going to run that into with most celebrities or most uh, local politicians usually aren't that smart. They haven't been trained. But particularly for a national politician, you could very well run into that. If you have, uh, sometimes they will give slanted, distorted statements. How do you handle that? If they, if they, if they, what if they just outright lie? For example, uh, there's a lot of cases where where uh, politicians outright lie. It is not against your code of it should not be against anybody's code of ethics in a free society anyway, in a democratic and free market society, uh, freedom of 
of journalism society, it is not uh, against the rules to prove that he's lying. If you can if you can gather the proof, that can be in the same story. So this person lies, and you provide the proof that he's lying. Now, again, that having said that, again, I've seen a lot of a lot of journalists in America, specifically, uh, think. Let me see. Their perspective is the person's lying when at least half the country doesn't think he's lying. Um, they are. So again, we're getting back into a lot of heavy bias in America right now with a very partisan uh, media and uh, a very sharply divided country uh, because of that. Um, and part of the problem is part of the uh, part of the uh, citizenry is listening to well, they're they're listening to their own favorite news, and so some of them are listening only to the liberal media, some are listening only to the conservative media, and then the result is a type of what we call groupthink. I'll put a few of these words up here. A couple of uh, psychological problems that are happening. First off, the idea of groupthink is if you get in a situation where the only opinions you hear are those that support you. Uh, and everybody that all your friends, all the people you respect, all share your ideas. Then anything that you, the, the more rigid becomes your thinking, and the less likely you can even consider anything outside of your of your conceptual framework. And in fact, uh, in looking at it, one of the great authors, uh, I remember his name. Uh, no. Maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, but there's one there's one author when you get into working on your theory, your theses and so forth, you might want to read him. Um, anyway, if you just look up scientific revolutions, you'll probably you'll find him. That's all I have to do. Is look, whenever I forget his, in fact, uh, maybe I'll look right now. Uh, whenever I I forget his name, I just go to Google and say scientific revolutions, and he brings up they bring up his name. But he's that famous, even though his research, his book was written in the 1960s. So he's a long time ago, but he is he is kind of the definitive uh, a source when it comes to um, the way we think uh, as it relates to uh, communication and so forth. So um, I will just go get his name while I'm thinking about it, because um, you might need to refer to him when you start working on your thesis study. And probably as soon as I type it, I'll remember it. Thomas Kuhn. I don't know that I've ever met anybody with that name, so that's one reason I struggle remembering it. But Thomas Kuhn uh, made note, um, basically, you know, throughout history, there have been revolutions in science, going all the way back to where, on the one hand, we were talking about, uh, you know, the Earth being flat, you know, or the Earth being the center of the universe. Uh, the sun going around the earth, stuff like that. So, you know, there have been in science a lot of false science over the over the, the millennia and centuries of mankind. And so he, he goes back and looks at those scientific revolutions and, and what they might have in common. And one thing that he noted was that in most scientific, most sci scientific revolutions, the revolutionaries uh, are young. At least when they start their battle, they're young. Uh, and one of the reasons why that's true is because I like to compare our our minds to uh, <clears throat> uh, when, I, when I was they still exist I guess but in my in my when I was young uh, there was uh, a a kid's toy <clears throat> not really a toy kind of like a game kind of like an activity we'll call it an activity where they had long pieces of metal strip with holes in them and uh, and you could build things, buildings and cars and uh, towers and all sorts of stuff by taking those these different uh, lengths of, of metal strips and taking a bolt and a nut and bolting them together. So you could make an Eiffel Tower, you could make a building. They even also would produce small motors, so you could build a car and put a, a bolt in a car and it would actually drive. So they had more than just the metal strips uh, with some of their um, their uh, anyway, what they call it? They call it erector sets, was what they called it. Anyway, 
the mind is a little bit like the erector set in that um, in that as, starting when we're a baby uh, I would some would suggest even before we're a baby before we're born we start trying to figure out what the heck is going on around us okay so even when you're a baby in the womb you're trying to figure out what's going on uh, and, and indeed uh, there's recommendations that a mother who's uh, well, a woman who's pregnant should be playing like uh, uh, you know Mozart and, and other classical music this um, makes your kids smarter even in the womb you start you start to help him start thinking about stuff and so that's one of the the recommendations and then so they they are in essence piecing together what it would uh, Kuhn would refer to as a conceptual framework they're taking concept by concept and piecing it together and trying to make sense out of the world the older we get the more rigid becomes our conceptual framework we have put all these pieces of metal together. If you start building the erect, if you can imagine building the Eiffel Tower with these strips of metal. At first, as you're building a, a, a tower, like the Eiffel Tower, it's very flexible. You have those four, maybe four columns going up and attaching at the top. But as you start making crossbars and maybe diagonal bars and piecing those together, it becomes more and more rigid. So it's, it's not flexible anymore. It's rigid. And that's what you know he would suggest happens to our minds. The older we get, uh, the more rigid becomes our thinking because we've put in so many pieces to our rector set, so to speak, so many concepts that come together and they, they support each other. And if we are faced with a concept that doesn't make sense in our rector set, in our conceptual framework, we just throw it away. And we call it nonsense. And so there may be very valid uh, information that would challenge our thinking, but if it makes no sense to us, we throw it away, call it nonsense, and consider it of no worth. And so what happens in a scientific revolution is they start, look, they start finding these anomalies, things that don't fit into the theory, into the established theory. And they, they, those anomalies ultimately lead to a brand new theory because the anomalies do not support the current theory. Uh, well, we as individuals have a hard time dealing with those anomalies. And we do, just like scientists have for centuries, sometimes throw out perfectly good information, perfectly good anomalies, anomalies that should mean something, but we can't figure out how these anomalies work in our, in our conceptual framework. And so we throw that, those concepts away as nonsense. They do not make sense to us. So if we're involved with, a, with this group think situation where everybody uh, agrees with us, they start they start feeding us more and more concepts, more and more evidence that we're right. And the more we put all those, that evidence into our conceptual framework from people who support our thinking, the far less it's far less likely than we will ever consider the opposition idea, the other idea. And right now in America, that is really bad is the, the, the journalists and a lot of the people in America are in two poles and they think they're absolutely right and anybody who disagrees with them is an idiot, if not a fool. A fool, an idiot, a liar, they're something. Because what this person, this side is saying does not fit into their conceptual framework and what this side is saying does not fit into their conceptual framework, they're about as polarized as can be right now, which actually I think is dangerous to the American society. And it's not just happening in America. It's happening in lots of places in the West. I don't know how far it extends uh, around the world. But definitely in America, definitely in Great Britain, um, we're seeing the same sort of thing happening. Um, and part of that is because, very much because, the sources of information have become polarized, media being one of them, uh, universities being one of them. Universities in America are controlled by liberals almost exclusively, uh, unless there are private universities set up by a church or something like that. Almost all the universities are controlled by liberals in America. Liberals, again, liberals there might not be the same as liberal here. Um, I've explained, maybe explained here, I don't remember. But in America, I'm a conservative. In Kazakhstan, I'm a liberal. It depends what you're comparing yourself to. Uh, in Kazakhstan, I'm a, I'm a liberal because Kazakhstan doesn't have free press and free speech and free assembly. 
uh, doesn't have free freedom of religion. So when I go to Kazakhstan, I am a flaming liberal because I'm in favor of all those freedoms. In America, I'm in favor of all those freedoms still, and actually I feel like the liberals, the so-called liberals in America, are restraining free speech. Uh, they're restraining free press and so forth in ways that are dangerous to society. So I'm the same person, but I'm a conservative in America and I'm a liberal in Kazakhstan. So it depends how you're, what you're comparing yourself to. Um, so getting back then, um, by the way, back here, um, they've actually done some recent studies where they studied uh, college students and they uh, exposed college students to ideas that uh, were surprising, like it might have been something related, I, I think, maybe to um, to quantum physics or something. Quantum physicists right now are coming with ideas that are totally bizarre to the average person, um, such as that we don't really exist, that we are somebody's computer program, and that they're seriously testing that idea, um, that we don't really, that we don't have free agency and so forth, that we are somebody's pro program. Uh, because of some of their other research is leading in that direction, as they're seriously there's like uh, uh, some professors at, at University of Washington near where I live have gotten, gotten have received big grant money to try to to try to catch the superhuman that has programmed us to try to catch them because the programming can't be infinite if it's a real person. It, it's someplace you always take shortcuts in games and we're just at somebody's game. Well, anyway, I think that's bizarre, but nonetheless, that's, there are serious scientists talking about that. So they presented an idea like this to the students and to see who would really understand and be at least somewhat accepting of that possibility. And what they found was the stupidest students were the one that were, were willing to accept that possibility. The smartest students already, even as college students, their conceptual frameworks had already become too rigid to accept that, even though these serious scientists were saying this was true, or at least very likely, whatever it was, probably not what the one that I was, uh, the, the, what the scientists I was talking about were talking about, it was something bizarre that a lot of scientists do, do believe in, and the smart students couldn't accept it, as well as the stupid students. So this idea of this conceptual rigidity is a problem, even starting in, in your college life. Uh, the, your willingness to be open to new ideas. Anyway, groupthink is a problem, um, and uh, and you can find that within politics. So, um, trying to get somebody to even budge, to even consider the possibility from the other side, is sometimes difficult uh, in in, a, in the world today. Uh, we're running out of time. Let me uh, go through a couple other things here real quick. I guess what I was trying to get to there is that don't allow your own conceptual framework to totally bias your reporting. But on the other hand, if you are sure you have the facts to prove somebody's lying, you can't. You, you should you, you know make, report those facts. Uh, make sure they're authoritative. Make sure you give good sourcing. Don't don't make it your opinion, but cite your source for those facts that dispute what the person said that you think is a lie. Uh, investigate reporter that maybe the world has ever had known. Um, he had an incredible network of, of uh, sources uh, throughout government and throughout the world to where he, he, he had an investigative story every day. He had a daily column. Um, 900 newspapers in America carried his column, which was like twice as much as hardly any other column in America. Because it was true, it was news. It wasn't uh, entertainment. It was news and considered very important that everybody wanted Jack Anderson's column because it was the cutting edge news. Uh, my two of my college uh, uh, classmates uh, were on his team. One was his editor, and one was his number one uh, reporter uh, that worked with him. Anyway, Jack Anderson used to say. When you're talking to politicians, the, the, old, the old saying is that you get half of the truth from one side, half the truth from the other side. He said, that's not true with politicians. 
is not an additive or process, it's a multiplication process. And when you multiply, you may know that when you multiply one half times one half, what do you get? One half times one half. One quarter. So his position was, when you're talking to politicians, uh, you don't get one half side from one side and one half from the other side because you multiply that, you get one quarter of the truth because they're always lying to you and always deceiving you. And so a lot of his sources were uh, people were bureaucrats, people who were not politicians. They were people in the government, but not politicians. And he used to brag that he got the, he would find out information before the president did. Uh, he was, he had that good of a network. You know, we need more Jack Andersons. Um, so be careful about uh, your sourcing. A politician is not a good source uh, in some ways in that they do, on both sides, you'll get both sides twisting and turning the facts and they may confuse your readers as much as anything. So try to go outside those politicians when you can uh, to, to verify what's true and not true because politicians are the least credible people in the world, pretty much, uh, pretty much the least. Um, we talked about the, the nature of interviewing and how you kind of build, uh, you need to think about that. Uh, how do you build up to your toughest questions? And then how do you drop back and try to calm them down a little bit so they'll talk to you in the future? Uh, but you can't avoid your, your tough questions. Uh, you need to but build up to them and then drop down and end your, your interview on a more positive note. Um, <clears throat> kind of tied to that is I've done a lot of, uh, I've gotten a lot of good re political reporting by doing personality profiles. I'm not going to take more time to talk about personality profiles today. Other than that, it's a good way to really get in with politicians and understand where they're coming from and getting uh, scoops on the other media. Uh, because I, what I would do is I'd take the politician out to lunch. And so we would be together like for two hours, chatting and eating and drinking for two hours. And that gave them time to bring up subjects that I that other reporters were not aware of. And so I scooped the other newspapers a lot by just taking politicians to lunch. Um, just over a period of time, they're going to come up with something that nobody knew. Uh, in one case, it was uh, a city councilman of a major city who uh, uh, had decided he was also an architect. The The city council was a half-time job, and here he had a full-time architectural job. And so he, he finally, you know, I was not anticipating this. He got around to the saying, you know, I'm thinking I either have to go up in politicians or just get out of uh, go out of politics, up in politics or out of politics. Uh, this right now is not really fair to my family. I'm having to work too hard to maintain my job, my full-time job, and this part-time city council job. Uh, so I have to make a decision. Well, that was a scoop. That was an important story that this uh, very popular city councilman was having to wrestle with that issue. And so that, that led to, that was my lead for the story, definitely, that I probably got about an hour into our interview, or maybe even longer than that. So sometimes, uh, and that kind of goes back, if you remember, uh, one of the other uh, recommendations by, in, in, the, uh, in my textbook is uh, moving. That was the, uh, uh, the reporter, or the editor rather, from uh, Rolling Stone magazine. Now he did it actually with, kind of going to this area a little more, with personalities, with with the celebrities, with movie stars and musicians and stuff like that. He would literally, in some cases, move in with them. Uh, with the Eagles band, he was with them for a whole month before he wrote a story. I mean, that's, that's more than two hours. So in a whole month, you can get a whole lot of stuff. Um, so he, he would literally move in. He, he mentioned he moved in into the ghetto, into the worst part of town and lived with a, a African-American family and just followed his kid around to see what his life was like. So that was another one of his move-in stories. Uh, so in a sense, my two hours with politicians was a little, wasn't a full move-in, but it was kind of like a move-in in that I had two hours 
to just chat and to warm warm things up and help get them to trust me more like a friend, which is what you're trying to do frequently with an interviewee. You're trying to get them to, to think of you like a friend. It is a short-term friendship. They know that you're, you're a journalist. They know that they're, in my case, I, I record most of these sorts of interviews. They know they're on tape, and yet they still say stuff in some cases. As I mentioned, uh, two mayors lost their job because they told me stuff they shouldn't have told me. Um, even though the, the recording was the, the recording machine was on, they knew it was on. They still told me that stuff they didn't they shouldn't have told me. Uh, so politicians are actually sometimes some of the easiest people to expose because they like to talk, and they do not they do not uh, uh, stop themselves from saying stupid things sometimes things that will get them pushed out of office. So because they like to talk so much. Uh, those can be some of your best stories because you can expose them for doing bad things and they convict themselves right out of their own mouth, uh, so to speak. So uh, we're out of time, so I'll stop there. But just wanted to uh, we'll talk maybe a little more about that on uh, on Friday, some of the other challenges you might have in your interviews and how to handle them. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, these are a couple of the ideas we talked a little bit about before. The, kind of augment those ideas. Okay, again, uh, I hope everybody that has uh, goes back to you. Okay, thank you.